Welcome to HomeRecordingMadeEasy.com and here on my YouTube channel and in this video we're going to start to take a look at um, my vinyl collection and specifically my Led Zeppelin uh, vinyl and entire collection. Now this video idea came to me, um, it was kind of, um, it started a few months ago when I did a studio tour video and if you haven't seen that video there's a link in the description box below and part of that video I was showing you my vinyl collection, some of the rare pieces of vinyl I have from a few different artists and talked a little bit about my passion for collecting vinyl and records and those sorts of things. Um, and that video got, in those, that section of the video got a lot of attention and a lot of people wrote me emails and left comments and said, we'd like to see more about your vinyl collection. It was really cool. Can you do a video on that? And I started to think about that and thought, well, that really has nothing to do with home recording and mixing and mastering and tutorials and all of that stuff. However, um, one of the things that I thought about is I said, you know, part of what I do here um, as far as training courses and things for you guys so you can make music in your home studios, I also do a lot of teaching about the music business and how you can start your own home studio business and start making some money. And I do a lot of private training and I do videos on that as well. Um, and if for you guys have been following me a while, you've seen those videos on YouTube, you've seen them on my website. And one of the things that kind of ties this whole thing together is the only uh, reason why um, I'm really in the music industry today and ultimately have my own music studio business um, is that for my love way back many many years ago my discovery in love of Led Zeppelin which um, really turned me on to becoming a musician and a guitar player which then turned me on to be a collector which then turned me on to learning how to write and record and produce my own music and ultimately uh, you know become a recording engineer and mixing engineer and having my own home studio business so that was kind of the tie between Led Zeppelin my discovery of Led Zeppelin um, and the collectible side of Led Zeppelin and that how it led me to the music industry ultimately and that is why I'm here today so I guess without the discovery of Led Zeppelin and Jimmy Page and the love of being a guitar player I wouldn't be where I am today and that is kind of the tie of this video to home recording made easy so I got a lot of requests to do a video like this we're gonna take a look at every piece of memorabilia including vinyl and everything that I have here and I'm gonna show you an overview of the collection in a second and this series will probably be I don't know four five six seven videos who knows where well, we're gonna go through every piece of, uh, of collectible that I have some of the stuff is very rare some of the stuff is easily uh, you know acquired online commercially and just talk about how I got into collecting why I collect Led Zeppelin some of the cool stuff that I have and again ultimately um, you know how it led me to the music industry so I hope you found or you find this video exciting and informative I will put some timestamps below each video so you can skip around if you don't want to watch the whole thing it'll be a lengthy series I know but for some of you you guys will really enjoy this so I hope you enjoyed the video leave comments below uh, let me know what you thought of this uh, series of videos and I'll see you soon we're going to turn the camera around now and I'm going to give you kind of an overview of the entire collection and then we'll jump in and look at each piece specifically up close and personal so I'll see you guys in a few seconds. Okay, let me uh, give you kind of just an overview of the entire collection as it's kind of laid out here. And again, we'll get up close and personal with every one of these pieces throughout the next several videos. But we have a whole table here full of uh, live bootlegs, uh, recordings, live concerts on cassette, to hardcover books, to CDs, commercial release CDs, and some rare bootlegs. We have box sets. We have a whole video we'll do on magazines with uh, Led Zeppelin or Led Zeppelin-like, meaning, you know, Page Plant solo on the cover, probably over a hundred of those. We have um, some rarities and a scrapbook I put together many years ago that I'll show you a bunch of stuff on the inside of that. We have a bunch of music magazines from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, and collector's guides, we'll talk about those. We have a bunch of um, live um, uh, recording guides that we'll talk about kind of ties back into the cassettes that we spoke about a minute ago uh, we also have let's see a bunch of comic books here as well which are becoming more and more uh, sought after and collectible um, we have a bunch of well, we have guitar picks we have some uh, vinyl 45s nothing real rare here but um, all US pressings but cool to have nevertheless all in mint condition never played we have a bunch of tour programs from Page and Plant, Robert Plant, Jimmy Page, the Page and Plant Tour, and we have some original 1975 and 1979 
four programs, the original ones from back in the 70s we'll talk about. We have a couple of reprints from 77. Then we have a bunch of vinyl on box sets, box, uh, all the super deluxe box sets. We'll go through some of those. I'll show you those. Um, we have then my vinyl collection. We have a lot of commercially released stuff as well as, you know, some rarities such as uh, things like this, things like this. We'll talk about each one of those. And then we have a whole stack of vinyl, everything from commercially uh, released stuff like the Black Crows and Jimmy Page to Jimmy Page's Outrider to The Firm. And then we also have a bunch of Led Zeppelin's uh, stuff, original pressings, still sealed, never opened. We'll go through each one of those. So that is kind of the overview of the entire collection. And again, in the next set of videos, we'll go through everything piece by piece. And I will talk to you about each piece and how I acquired it and some maybe some cool information about it. And uh, hopefully you guys will like it. So here's the collection and we will also uh, Oh, we'll talk about some t-shirts as well. Got some t-shirts from the Page and Plant Tour back in 1995 and 1998. We'll talk about those too. So that's it. So uh, come back and we'll, in a second and uh, we'll switch camera angles and we'll go through the collection piece by piece. Okay, everybody, welcome back. So I've got now this elaborate setup here to try to show you this collection piece by piece in as good a detail as I possibly can. So hopefully this will work for you. Hopefully the video is going to look okay and everything is going to be in focus. I have a nice uh, contraption set up here. We have all the items down here in front. We'll talk about um, each item as it comes across the frame here. Um, so in this first video, we're going to talk about really kind of the live recordings and the bootlegs. Uh, primarily all the cassette bootlegs that I've collected over the years and some CDs and some video. And then we'll jump into another video in a, after that. So, but before we get started, I've taken some notes here. And, and again, the first thing I want to do is I want to kind of just maybe share a minute or two with you on on how I got into Led Zeppelin and again how it kind of um, you know, brought it full circle to where I am today here learning in a home studio. So my introduction to Led Zeppelin where I really started to pay attention was probably around 1983 as I was a freshman uh, in high school. Now Led Zeppelin was already you know disbanded by 1980 when John Bonham unfortunately died. I knew about Led Zeppelin when I was you know a preteen, but I really didn't really get introduced to them proper as it were until about 1983 and I and I remember the day like it was yesterday we used to ride the school bus across town to school in 1983 I was a freshman in high school and a friend of mine his name is Frank used to carry on the school bus one of these old uh, you know big boom box style radios you can if you remember the uh, the cassette player radios the big radios where you stuck a cassette in kind of held it on your shoulder uh, one of those kinds of radios um, and every morning for an entire year, he brought this boom box onto the school bus and he was playing this, um, you know, playing this music for everyone on the bus to hear. And at the time, I didn't know what it was, but I really enjoyed the music and come to find out after the fact it was Led Zeppelin's physical graffiti. So my real introduction to Led Zeppelin and really paying attention to the music was on that school bus listening to physical graffiti. Primarily the first side of the cassette, which had songs like Custard Pie, had Cashmere, and the one song that really uh, caught my attention was the guitar riff from the Rover. If you know the Rover, um, it's got a really kind of a, you know, bluesy kind of a down and dirty, sexy guitar riff. And when I first heard that guitar riff, I said to myself, what is that? And I really was drawn to the guitar sound, the tone, and primarily that riff. And that was the riff or the song on that school bus in 1983 that really made me want to learn how to play guitar and wanted, I wanted to learn how to do that. So that whole first side of physical graffiti within my time of dying, Kashmir, The Rover, Custard Pie, and there's a few other songs I forget off the top of my head. We listened to that same cassette every single day going back and forth to school. And if it wasn't for my friend Frank, uh, at that time in 1983, on that school bus, I may have never been really introduced to Led Zeppelin in that way and never would have struck me that way and I may have never picked up the guitar and therefore, fast forward many years later, I wouldn't be sitting in this studio doing what I'm doing. So I remember that moment like it was yesterday. So all through the 80s, um, 83 to about 89, 1990, I didn't really know about collecting Led Zeppelin. I knew about the studio recordings. I went out like a lot of you probably and bought all the studio albums and I got my first guitar. It was a, it was a Les Paul copy because Jimmy Page was my favorite guitar player. So he had a Les Paul and I couldn't afford a Gibson Les Paul. So I, I, I managed to get my parents to buy me, uh, I think it was an Epiphone 
uh, Heritage Cherry Sunburst Les Paul. For my first guitar, we bought it used for a few hundred bucks in a, in a music shop, and I started to learn um, how to play Led Zeppelin riffs, taking some private lessons, learning chords, and all the things you do when you become a guitar player. And for the next five or six years, my main goal as a beginning guitar player is I just wanted to play all Led Zeppelin music. I didn't even care so much about the, the solos because I wasn't advanced enough to play guitar solos then, but I wanted to play the riffs that I heard on that physical graffiti record. So now you fast forward to about 1990, 1991, and still being a big Led Zeppelin fan, uh, playing music and learning the instrument, but I really didn't know about the whole world of collecting. And then I met a friend through a coworker of mine, and that friend's name was Jim. Um, and Jim was a big music fan as I was. He played guitar as well, and he was a few years older than me, but he was a huge Aerosmith fan and he was a huge Aerosmith collector. And as we became friends, um, through a mutual friend, we started talking about music and he invited me over to his apartment um, and he was showing me all these Aerosmith bootlegs and bootleg videos and at that time bootleg cassettes and CDs were coming onto the market in the bootleg market. Um, and, and I was like, wow, I didn't know there was such a thing. And he said, yeah, if you're into Led Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin's an even bigger collector market than Aerosmith. And that was what started to get me into collecting Led Zeppelin. Um, so I start, he took me to my first record conventions where we used to go to record conventions at different uh, hotel ballrooms around Connecticut and on the East Coast, going to find those, those hidden gems, those bootleg recordings, those, li or those uh, uh, rare memorabilia items that you couldn't find in stores. A lot of stuff wasn't released commercially by the band. It was all this underground stuff. This was long before the internet um, really came into play. It was really um, kind of a, you know, almost like uh, like that show American Pickers, like American Pickers style. You're going out into different collections and different record conventions and trying to find that hidden gem. Um, and part of that was I used to read a, um, a magazine that my friend Jim turned me on to called Goldmine Magazine. And Goldmine Magazine was a collector's magazine. Um, and we have some gold mine magazines around here. I'll show you later on in some of the other videos. I have some Zeppelin gold mine magazines. But in the back of gold mine magazine, there was a classified section, like classified ads of collectors that wanted to buy and trade and meet up with other collectors of all different styles of music and different bands and different artists. Again, this was before the internet, before email and all of that stuff. So I would flip through the back of gold mine magazine and I would look for people that were wanted to collect and trade Led Zeppelin live bootlegs and at that time it was cassettes and that's what we have on the screen here just a very small portion of the cassettes and um, I met a few people and one particular person um, at a Long Island New York his name was uh, Butch Quigley and Butch Quigley was right around my age and he was a, a Led Zeppelin tape collector and he was my first introduction really into the world of collecting Led Zeppelin bootlegs um, and this is what I have in front of me here on the table Again, I have a total of, I took some notes, um, I have a total of 144 uh, Led Zeppelin concerts um, from 1968 through 1980, all throughout the years. Um, I, and uh, I have, um, let's see, uh, four uh, Coverdale page after Led Zeppelin in the, in the mid 90s. I have four of those bootlegs on cassette. I have three of the firm, which we'll talk about later, and also um, four or five uh, page and plant um, stuff from the mid, early to mid, 90. So here is one of those trays of cassettes and what was really special about collecting the cassettes again You would meet up somebody you would meet up with someone in Goldmine magazine through an ad and you would actually write a letter You know remember again before computers where you'd sit down and actually get a, a pad and a pen and write out a letter And say hey, my name is you know Dave and I'm looking to collect some tapes that you like to trade and you mail off the letter to my friend in Long Island or my soon-to-be friend Butch and Butch would write back and say, yeah, I'd love to trade with you. He'd get a letter a week later, um, and he would send me a handwritten list of all the shows that he had had. And he would, and, and the whole concept was that you would have shows and he would have shows, different shows, and you would trade. You would make, you'd make duplicate copies of your cassettes and you would trade one show for another show. And that, just like you would with baseball cards or sporting cards, you have duplicates of things, you would trade off and you try to build your baseball card collection. Same thing with, uh, with live recordings. The difference is you didn't really have duplicates, you had to make the duplicates, you know, with the double cassette decks where you would copy one show, send it off, and then he would send his back to you. And over a few years, you'd build up this large collection 
of shows. And that's what I've done here. One of the things that I did here, and I'll try to get this in the camera. I don't know if it's going to focus very well. I'm going to try. It's really focusing on, let me see if I, okay, there we go. Um, where not only did you get the tapes, but I was really, you know, um, really uh, ADD, if you will, on how I would catalog the the shows so i would make up in an electric typewriter <laughs> these little covers we make up these little templates um where you have the you know led zeppelin the venue of the show flip it over here you'd have the time how many minutes the show was a quality rating like a an audio quality from you know one being the worst 10 being the best and whether it was an audience recording or a soundboard recording don't know how well you can see that detail here i'll try to get it up here in the camera Okay, and then we would turn it around here. We would label the, the actual cassette so you knew what it was. You would get all real high quality, uh, you know, Maxell cassettes. You know, with real, with, at that time, the high quality tape that lasted the longest and had the best sound, you know, quality. It's kind of funny talking about it now, you know, when you have CDs and MP3s. And then we would, uh, we would have the track listing. You know, so this particular show, here was the track listing that they played for that particular show. This was uh, part one. So again, if I can get the camera to focus here. This was part one of a two-part show. This one happened to be Vancouver, Canada, March 19th, 1975. And then you would catalog them and I, you'd put them in these like these little trays here um, and you'd put everything in, in, you know, in by date order. And you would collect and you would swap shows back and forth. And as you had gotten everything that my friend Butch had and he had gotten everything that I had and now my list went from maybe a handful of shows to, you know, double the size. Then you would meet other collectors from Gold My Magazine. And I had at one time, I probably had six or eight guys that I was trading with all over the country. And again, it was all done on the honor system. There, there was no, you know, FaceTime and, you know, text messages. It was all, you wrote a letter to me, I wrote a letter to you, and it was on the honor system. You know, that we made an agreement through the mail, through a letter, what shows we were going to trade. And then we would, uh, you know, copy our tapes and we would mail off each other's shows. Um, and, and, and for me, the goal was, you know, I didn't know, I, I, at one point I wanted to just get every show that was available. There was a time where I wanted every bootleg that was, was available and in circulation I wanted. It didn't matter how the sound quality was. Most of the sound quality of this stuff were either audience recordings and some soundboard recordings. But back in those days in the 70s, the, the, you know, the recording technology was really kind of crap. And bootlegging was illegal. Led Zeppelin didn't allow you to bootleg their shows. So these were all recorders and things that were snuck into the venues. And so the sound quality is not that great on these things, um, to be quite honest. Out of all the shows that I have, there's maybe a hundred, or excuse me, maybe less than 10 uh, full concerts where the sound quality came right off the soundboard and it sounds great. And a lot of those shows have now been released by Jimmy Page and official Led Zeppelin merchandise over the last four or five years. So what you thought was a real gem back in 1990, you can now get commercially completely remastered. It's almost kind of sad, you know, but back in those, those days, um, Led Zeppelin didn't have any live stuff except for the one commercial Song Remains the Same album, which we'll talk about later. So collecting tapes was a really, really uh, cool thing and kind of my introduction into collecting live concerts um and so yeah so 144 now what came along with that uh, the tape collecting was so big at that time in the led zeppelin world anyway i'm going to move these out of the way here you can see again i have like i don't know 15 of these full trays filled with cassettes like i said you saw it in the intro video where i kind of panned around and showed you all the stuff i have but there's 144 complete concerts not every concert they ever did but a not every concert they ever did was ever bootlegged. So I probably have 80% of the bootlegs that were actually in circulation at that time. Um, and I'm gonna put this out of frame here. And now the way, um, again, tape collecting was, was so big um, back in those days that, they, that there were collectors that actually writ, had written books. And here's one of those books here. And again, I'll try to zoom in on this. This is called Led Zeppelin Live. And this is the uh, illustration of underground tapes of all the live concerts that were ever done by Led Zeppelin. Someone had gone through some of the larger bootleggers that had everything, go through and actually wrote a book and actually cataloged every show that was ever circulated um, at that particular time. And what was really cool about this, there's some cool photos in the book, but was what was really cool, and I, and I know it's hard to see the detail here, 
And by the way, you can get this book on eBay for probably 10 or 12 bucks. This bootleg still exists. This book still exists. But we used to call this, you know, affectionately like the Led Zeppelin Bible. You know, this was like, this was like the guide. You wanted to get every show that was in this book. And what was really cool about this book um, is that it would start from 1968, from the very first show that was out and about. This one is, this happens to be September 20th at Stock in Stockholm, Sweden. It would tell you the length of the show, the track list, the quality of the recording, and then it would give like a little paragraph of what, you know, the, the writer of this, of this book, what he felt about the performance in detail, you know, how Robert sang that night, how the band played that night. Really, really cool. Some really cool inside information about each bootleg that was out there. And what I used to do is I used to, and you can see it here, I used to highlight every time I got a new tape in order for me to know what I needed and what I didn't need, because I got rid of the paper list, as I started using this guide. And I would highlight all the shows that I would get. So my first, my earliest show that I have, there's only one show uh, when, as of the writing of this book from September 20th, uh, 1968 in Stockholm, Sweden. The second show they did, I have. I don't have the first one, but I have the second one from December 30th in a Spokane, Washington. Uh, 65 minutes and it'll tell you that it was an incomplete show meaning the bootleg is 65 minutes but the show itself was much longer than that but only 65 minutes at the time of this writing actually existed and again the track list tells you about the uh, about the quality of the recording in this particular case it says distorted and unbalanced recording from very near the stage <laughs> so you can kind of tell what kind of quality you were getting and it, to me, it didn't matter. I, I just wanted to get every show I possibly could. And as I was going through this book, I would start at the beginning. And as you can see, I, you know, I have a lot of these. There's several, you know, and where there wasn't one, uh, some here I have, uh, I have all these. And then I would get to like uh, here, uh, March 13th um, from Copenhagen, Denmark. I don't have that particular bootleg. I wasn't able to find it, but it exists. And so this was one of the books that I, I lived with in my, you know, this is the like tape collecting guide on how you, got a, how you got a hold of all these bootlegs and told you a little bit about them. Really interesting read if you're into that sort of stuff. So here was the first book, Led Zeppelin Live. And again, you can get this on eBay. Then a few years later, they came out with another edition, Led Zeppelin Live, the updated edition. And the reason why it's called the updated edition is because over time, you know, more bootlegs had surfaced, more concerts had existed now on tape that weren't around when the first book was written. And once again, I would go through and had different photos and different information. And I would go through and I didn't highlight this time. I put a little star again next to all the shows that I had and whatever was missing from the first book I tried to acquire. Some I did, some I didn't. But again, probably in the first book, probably 80 to 85 percent of the concerts that were available I own. In the second book, it's probably more like 70%. Um, there was a time where I stopped collecting tapes. Um, so this was the second book. Again, you can get this on eBay, Led Zeppelin Live Updated Edition. And then the final edition came out a few years later after that. And again, I don't know the exact year, but this is called Led Zeppelin Live, another, another version. And this was like the final edition. Um, and this has everything. Um, so when this came out, again, there was some more shows in this book than was in the prior book. But it also had everything that was included in the first two books. Um, and again, I went through and tried to, uh, you know, get as many of these as I possibly could. And so I did this, God, for a few years. And, and again, so between using, you know, Goldmine Magazine, meeting people through the classified ads, getting my, my Led Zeppelin uh, underground tape guides, I, that was my first introduction into collecting. And I collected, like I said, about 144 shows. Um, and tried to get as many as I could. And then right around, you know, I would say that was right around maybe 1990, right around 1993, 94, again, I'm not sure if I'm getting the years quite right, my memory's a little, <laughs> a little foggy, um, is when the introduction of CDs came along. Now, I don't mean commercial CDs. Commercial CDs were released around 1982, 83. But I mean bootlegs on CD, and that was like the next big thing. I, everyone stopped collecting tapes and everybody wanted CDs because now they were making CD recorders for consumers where you can record, take a tape and transfer it to CD in your home. And those early recorders by companies like Panasonic, uh, Pioneer, Philips, 
Um, I mean, they were 1500 bucks for a unit, you know, and in that, at that time, you know, 1995, I was what, 25 years old, 24, 25 years old. You don't have a lot of money. A thousand dollars to have a CD burner in your house was like big time. You know, that was big time. You know, today, everything with a computer, you could, you could do everything, you know, it's almost laughable when you think about not that long ago to record your own CD was a big deal and getting bootlegs on CD was a big deal. And not only was it a big deal, it was very expensive. In some cases, hundreds of dollars for those discs when they first came out. And I have a few of them. I don't have a lot of Zeppelin on CD from a bootleg standpoint because um, I was, you know, again, I didn't have a lot of money in those days. Um, I was living at home and, you know, my parents probably 25, I was on my own 25, but I was working, making just enough to pay the rent, you know, with a roommate. And so to get these things was real, real hard to get. So here's the first one. Uh, and I'm just gonna show you these one, one at a time. I'm gonna zoom down here. That's as far as I can get the camera in. This is the BBC Original Masters. Um, and again, I think this was a two CD set. And again, they were nothing fancy. The first, you know, bootleg CDs were on regular old, you know, CDs. I'll try to bring this up so you can see this a little bit, you know, where someone just took a little, just stuck a label on it. This one's from, um, this is from London, March uh, 25th, 1971, okay? Cup, it's a two disc show. Again, there were nothing fancy. It was all done with home based CD recording units. Um, but again, it, I think, and again, I don't remember what I paid for these, but it wouldn't, I don't think you could have found that a double CD like this, you couldn't have found for less than 50 or 60 bucks at that particular time, especially if it had artwork like this. You know, with all the uh, with all the track listings and all that stuff. You know, so here is that. Here's the March 25th, 1971. Again, I had this on cassette. The reason why I got it on CD is the sound quality is fantastic. This is part of what came out on the complete BBC, BBC sessions that Jimmy Page released. That we'll look at that box set later. But back in the 90s, that didn't exist commercially. So to get this was a big deal. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one, which is another outstanding uh, sound recording for a bootleg, is Led Zeppelin's Return to Blueberry Hill. Again, this is this one. It was a gatefold, you know, had some cool pictures in it. And this one was from uh, Los Angeles, 1970, September 4th, 1970. Okay. And again, I, this was a double CD as well. And I believe this one even had some cool insert artwork. I'm trying to get, keep this in frame, sorry. So again, this was, you know, a big deal to find these. And where did I find these? Because again, there was no internet. Here's some artwork on the, on the disc itself. Pretty cool. Um, these I probably found in some record shop. My buddy Jim and myself, the Aerosmith collector, we go to all kinds of record shops, record conventions, as I said. He would collect Aerosmith. I was looking for Led Zeppelin and we would help each other. If I went out somewhere and found something really cool that was Aerosmith, um, we, he'd call me on the phone, I'd call him on the phone, run to a pay phone at that time, um, and say, hey, do you got this? No, you know, pick that up for me and I'll give you the money. It was that kind of a thing. And so, you know, if, he, if, if I found something like this in the store, or if he found a, a CD like this in the store and I wasn't with him, he'd call me up at the pay phone and we'd make a deal and uh, he, would, uh, he would get this. And I think he picked this one up for me is why I'm telling you that part of the story. So really cool, really cool CD. Uh, the next one here, again, I only have a few of these. This one is from, what is this from? This is from the last tour, 1980. Uh, this is uh, Led Zeppelin over Europe. This is, a, again, it says it's a picture disc, but it's not. It's not a pi picture disc. Um, it's just regular old, you know, CDs. Okay, cool. And again, really good sound quality on this one. So this is a really cool show to have. Um, and then I have, this was really cool. I bought this for the artwork. Let me see if I can zoom out a little bit here so you can see this. This came in a kind of, this is from Madison Square Garden. This came in a nice uh, open gatefold here with some really cool pictures. Uh, this show was from, uh, what I want to say, 1973. Let me look at the back here. I think it's 73. Yeah, uh, July 28th, 1973. This was the actual, one of the nights that they used to record the song Remains the Same. And what was really cool about this particular show is all of the songs that were replayed that night was on this recording. Meaning that when the song Remains the Same came out, all of you Led Zeppelin aficionados would know, uh, Black Dog, Over the Hills and Far Away, 
Misty Mountain Hop, The Ocean. Those songs were not part of the movie. They were left on the cutting room floor, as it were. They were included on, on this set here. And so again, you know, now the re-release of the song remains the same. All those songs have been included. Jimmy Page has cleaned them all up. They sound great. But again, back then, you couldn't find those songs. You could only find what was on the song remains the same, the official release. This was the other stuff. So this was all soundboard recording. That's why I picked this up and the cool artwork. Um, and this was like 150 bucks at the time. Um, I still think you can find this on eBay, but it's hard to come by, especially in this condition. It's in great condition. If there's not a mark on it, it's in really good condition. Just like the CDs I showed you, I, most of my stuff's in almost mint, if not dead mint condition. There's a few exceptions to that. So that's all the Led Zeppelin CDs that I have on bootleg. Um, now when this, we'll, we'll do a few more here. Now I also, in 1995 and 1998, 1995 when Robert Plant and Jimmy Page got back together to do their own kind of solo tour together where they did, um, you know, not only some Zeppelin classics redone, but they also had some new material. There was some CD bootlegs that came out then as well. Uh, the first one I have here, and I'll zoom in this one, is from 1995. This is Jimmy Page, Robert Plant. This is from the Toronto Sky Dome, March 27th, 1995. Has a really cool gatefold here. This is a soundboard recording, sounded really, really good. Um, again, 95 to get this stuff on CD, not easy to get, especially the Page and Plant tour because it was such a popular tour. It was the first time that those two got back together and did kind of a proper tour where they did a lot of Led Zeppelin classics. So to get these recordings and to get them in this kind of condition was not only hard to find, um, but it was expensive. <laughs> and I wanted to have a couple of shows from that tour. I didn't get everything that was available. There's a lot more out there, but I wanted to get stuff that had really good sound quality from the soundboard. So here's the first one with some cool artwork on it. Nice Zoso symbol. Uh, the second one I have, this is a really cool piece. This is from um, Japan. Um, and no Quarter Tour, Jimmy Page, Robert Plant. And this has got some really cool artwork and some insert uh, booklets. Again, soundboard recording. Uh, sounds really, really good for what it is for a bootleg. Has a kind of a, a pull-out poster here. See that? Really cool. Again, completely mint. No, no rips or tears in anything. Again, to find this particular version of this of this bootleg is not the easiest thing to find nowadays, although, again, now that CD burning and CD making in your house is so easy, um, these shows are a little bit easier to come by. And, and one of the reasons why I stopped kind of collecting tapes and bootlegs is because, um, for me, part of the, the fun, let me open this up so you can see the other side here of this bootleg. Again, this is from Japan, the No Quarter Tour. Really cool artwork here. Kind of bring this up so you can see it a little better. Oops. Okay. Um, again, part of the part of the 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 fun of getting this stuff was that it wasn't easy to find, that there was no internet, and that you had to kind of build relationships and meet people and go and go find the stuff. To me, that was that was the the journey of finding it was almost better than actually having it, you know. And so when CD burning in the 2000s uh, became where anybody can burn a CD at home and computers were able to do these sorts of thing. And then the internet kind of started in what, the early mid 90s by 95, 98, when, when internet was getting more popular, even though we had all, you know, dial up connections and stuff. But this stuff became a lot easier to find and it became a lot more mass produced. Um, and therefore it wasn't as, you know, it wasn't as fun to go out and find the cool piece because now almost anybody can have it. And so, you know, it kind of ruined that for me in a way. But that's that bootleg. Um, I have a couple more here. Here's one from 1998 tour. This is from Paris, France. This is right, this was um, broadcast on, uh, on, uh, on, on a radio station in France. So the sound quality is amazing. So I have this for that reason, because it sounds really good. And they never released anything live commercially, Page and Plant, for their tour except the, uh, I think it was Unleaded on MTV, that show, but everything else, I don't think there were any other official Page and Plant releases of live recordings. So to have these are pretty cool. Especially like shows like this where they did like Tangerine. They did some songs that they didn't normally do when they were on tour together, which is really cool. So that's that show. Um, I also have another, this, here you can see here, this one was $43. <laughs> 
back in those days. It's a lot for a CD. Um, this was from San Jose, May 20th, 1995. Again, another cool um, soundboard recording. And again, this was 50 bucks or $43. So it just goes to show, and this isn't even in mint condition. So it just goes to show how expensive this stuff was back then. Uh, and then lastly, this, is a, this, was, this was something you could buy at a store for a limited time. Um, this was called, this was released by Page and Plant, and a, a CD of them doing um, a couple of songs. And one song that they did that they didn't do in concert was they did Gallows Pole Four Sticks and they did um, What Is and What Should Never Be uh, acoustically. So I think I, bought the, I think I bought it for that reason, because they did that. I think that they also do the Rain song. No, I think they just did, I think they just did those, those, three, those three tunes. And What Is and What Should Never Be wasn't, uh, I think it was done acoustically on this, if I remember right. So I bought that for that by itself. And uh, last but not least, we'll take a look at some bootleg videos. Now we're talking about bootlegs. We'll take a look at some Zeppelin and Page and Plant bootleg video, and then we'll end this video and we'll move on to, on to more, all more commercially released stuff. So for again, for, for video, same thing as with audio, there was not a lot of Led Zeppelin live video that was available. Most of the stuff that you see on the internet and on YouTube today is all eight millimeter footage, silent footage, really crappy footage. And I have all of that as well. This is for, from a collector's point of view. But to find full shows, full concerts, was impossible, except for the song Remains the Same, which was commercially released. Now, since that time, Led Zeppelin's put out, you know, How the West Was Won back in the 90s and some of these newer box sets where, you know, Page is now releasing all of these concerts in parts and so they're not as special as they once were but again back in the 90s um here's the first uh video the first full show that i have this is uh, earl's court in england 1975 this show now part of it is in video form is on i think it's how the west is one on one of the dvds there's three songs for the professional footage this is the entire show professionally shot it's not as high quality as what you see on the DVDs today because they didn't have the technology or the, or the capability of cleaning up the video as much as they do today and the audio for that matter. But there is no commercial release of the full show. This is the full show. And I got this probably in the 90s. Two picture discs, really cool, not easy to find. In good quality, not easy to find. So that's my first Zeppelin DVD bootleg uh the second one same thing this was i think at the time this was 200 bucks if i remember right this was from august 11th 1979 nebworth um this again on how the west was won there are three or four songs that are included in that box set this is the complete show two dvd set the full show from august 11th 1979 nebworth all professionally shot um called The Final Cut, comes with a booklet, two DVDs, okay. You can't find this, complete. This is another show that on DVD, in this quality with this artwork, is very hard to find. Again, at the time, I think, at the time, I think it was close to 200 bucks just for this show, but it was such a sought after piece back then. Again, I don't know so much today because I don't follow the, the bootleg videos as much as I used to with Zeppelin. So you might be able to find this in different packaging. You may be able to find an older generation. Remember, all this stuff used to be on VHS tape. Um, and one of the things about collecting VH, VH, VHS tape, just like with cassettes, is every time you took, a, if you took the master of a tape, any tape, cassette or, or, or a videotape, you make that first copy, that copy becomes the first generation or second generation copy. The master is the original. Then you have the second generation copy. You copy the second generation copy. That copy becomes the third generation, fourth generation, so on and so forth. Every one of those generations, the quality of the video and the audio, especially the video, degrade. And so when you are collecting Led Zeppelin video or any bootleg video or even Led Zeppelin audio or any bootleg audio, you are looking for low generation copies. You are looking to get as close to the first generation as you could because that would have the best video and audio quality. This was a first generation DVD. Um, and that's why it was so expensive. You might be able to find this show three, third generation, fourth generation, where the video is really kind of crappy and the audio is kind of crappy, but you got the full show. That's not worth nearly as much 
as this. Um, the difference in price back then between a first generation or a second generation and a fourth generation could have been two or three times the cost. Because again, it was all about supply and demand. You couldn't find this anywhere back then. Um, so this is a special one. I really enjoy this. And again, you don't, you, you, uh, Jimmy Page has not released the entire show, although I'm sure he has it. Um, because some of the songs are on, on, the, on the box set, as I said, but to have the complete show is really, really cool. So here's that. Another show which has never been released by Jimmy Page is a professional shot of Seattle 1977. This is, again, another hard show to find. Very difficult to find the complete show. This is probably a second generation copy, maybe a third, but it's still pretty darn good. Um, to have the complete show, two discs at the Kingdom, very hard to find. Um, I know this. I know this. The footage exists. I'm a little surprised that Jimmy Page doesn't have this on any of the box sets. I wonder why. Maybe the stuff has been destroyed since this came out. But it did exist because this is all the professional shot at the Kingdom in Seattle. The venue used to film the concerts. Um, same thing, I think, in the Capitol Center in Maryland back in the '80s. They would film every concert, um, and so sometimes they would work out deals with the artists and the promoter. Sometimes they wouldn't. Um, it would all depend on the band and the particular contract for that particular concert. Um, but this was filmed, and, um, and it's never been released by Led Zeppelin or anybody associated with Led Zeppelin, but it does exist. And again, it's a very cool show from 77. There's nothing that's been released by Page from 77. There's 73, 75, 79, but you don't see any 77 tour, and this is one of them. So that's really cool. Uh, a commercial release CD, this is uh, the Blu-ray of The Song Remains the Same, the one that you could buy anywhere. Again, this is the one just like the VH, uh, VHS tape. doesn't have all the songs that are on the box sets today, but this is the original one that came out in uh, high definition. This is the non-high definition, Song Remains the Same. Again, this is just something you could have bought, you could still buy anywhere. It's the original just like the tape, nothing special. And then I have a couple of uh, Page and Plants. Um, let's see, a couple of Page and Plant bootleg DVDs I can share with you quickly and then we'll end this video. So the first one we have is a professionally shot from 1998 in Las Vegas. This is a two DVD, two DVD set. Um, soundboard audio, professionally shot video, looks gorgeous, awesome. Don't know if you could still find these anywhere. This used to be done, all the, um, the great Page Plants bootlegs used to come out of a company called Third Eye Productions. Um, and you can see, I don't know, maybe you can see it on the bottom here. Third Eye Productions was the company that used to do these. Um, he used to do an amazing job with the artwork, amazing job with multi-camera shoots. And again, uh, you know, th this stuff was not legal to do. How the hell he did it, I'll never know. He must have paid off somebody to get all that video equipment in there, but he was able to record these shows. Um, I don't think he's around anymore. I think you might be able to buy some of his stuff on eBay, but he, he used to have an online store. Or it wasn't even an online store. He, there was, he, had, a, he had a web page in the very early days of internet, but he had like a newsletter magazine, like a newspaper. And that's where I used to subscribe to his newspaper. Once a month it would come delivered to my house. And, uh, and I picked up page and plant stuff. So here's the first one. The second one is a three DVD set from 1996. This is uh, from Tokyo. Again, Third Eye Productions, really good quality stuff from Japan, really cool artwork. This is from Budokan. Uh, this one is from 1998. This is from um, Cologne, uh, Germany, August 23rd, 1998. Again, full show. This is all by Third Eye Productions again. And then I have 1995. Um, this is from um, California, live in Irvine, uh, October 3rd, 1995. There we go. Cool. And then I have September 12th, 1998, Mount View, California. Again, a Third Eye production release. Really cool. A picture of the ticket stub. All soundboard audio, all fantastic video. This is a TV collection, um, not from Third Eye Productions, but from another tra another vendor that I've got something from. All the page and plant stuff from all their different TV interviews from the United States and all over the world when they were uh, you know, getting back together for the 1994-95 tour. 
So there's some cool stuff on here. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame when they were inducted. Um, some stuff on uh, VH1 classics and some other programs. And then let's see, lastly, we have March 11th, 1995 from New Orleans. Again, this is a three, seat, a three DVD set from Third Eye Productions. Same tour, different venue, and a couple of different songs. There were some different songs that were played throughout that tour that they didn't play every single night, which is kind of cool. This had some bonus footage uh, from a couple other venues as well, which is really cool. And the last three DVDs I'll show you, um, just because we'll be done with the DVDs. Uh, the first one here is something that everybody, you know, a lot of you have or you can get anywhere. Here's how the West was won. Now, again, what made this really special at the time when it came out, you could still buy this anywhere for, you know, almost nothing, is that they, he put out a lot, of, a lot of video footage that, you know, that wasn't available. As I said, Earl's Court 75, there's five songs here on that, Earl, that Earl's Court DVD where I have the entire show, but he only released five songs. Uh, same thing with uh, Nebworth 79. He released five or six songs, well, maybe six songs here. I have the full two hours. Um, and then they also released... Um, at that time, the missing songs from The Song Remains the Same. I told you about the audio a few minutes ago on that, that bootleg CD where Black Dog, Misty Mountain Hop, and The Ocean were included. Um, that wasn't a part of the regular release back when it first came out. So that was cool. And then also uh, Albert Hall 1970, which was before that you couldn't get that on video. Not in good quality anyway. So that was a really cool thing to have. So this was really cool and this was something that was super exciting because it was the first time that Led Zeppelin officially put out additional video aside from the song Remains the Same. So it put a lot of the bootleggers kind of like, oh wow, we've been you know trying to get these things forever in bootleg and now here's part of that stuff released in pristine quality. So it was cool to have it in pristine quality but it was kind of a drag because it was like all those years of searching for that stuff and here he goes he just releases it for you but it would you know still it's still really cool um, and then let's see two more we have one here uh, storytellers Robert Plant from 2002 I think this was on VH1 or one of those shows um, someone had given this to me Again, it's not a bootleg but it's not something you can really find much anymore and then the last thing I have is a documentary on Peter Grant the the, the guy who um, managed Led Zeppelin. So this was something I bought off eBay. You could probably find it. Pretty cool story about Peter Grant and his management and how he got involved with Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin and that whole story. So that is now probably 35 minutes worth of uh, video here going through all the cassettes or you know the CDs and all the video bootlegs. So I hope you enjoyed this video and a look at the inside of my uh, bootleg collection. Uh, you know, come back for the next video. We're going to start looking at some of the vinyl and you know, keep, keep, stay tuned because there's probably going to be five or six videos when it's all said and done. So I appreciate you watching. Leave your comments below if you have any questions or you want to share anything about your uh, bootleg collection. If you have any Led Zeppelin bootlegs or if you're a boot, uh, Led Zeppelin collector in the past or even still today, I'd love to hear from you. Leave your comments below and I will see you in the next video.